Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 229th New Social Environment. I'm Cal McKeever, the publisher's assistant here at the Brooklyn Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Eddie Martinez and our beloved host, Jason Rosenfeld. We're also thrilled to have the poet Ali Black here, who will read to close today's program. To begin, I ask you in joining me in acknowledging the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation, the traditional owners of Lahavnakoig, the unceded land and waters on which we stand. The Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprisings in response to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McAtee, James Skurlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Rayshard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fills, Toyin Salau, Walter Wallace Jr., and countless others who we have lost to white supremacy and police violence in this country. And we acknowledge that justice will come from the streets and from the nation demanding accountability and refusing to move on until Black Lives Matter in the eyes of the state. Before I introduce our host, we'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce today's guest and host. Eddie Martinez is a Brooklyn-based artist whose work uh, joins together painting and drawing, abstraction and representation in non-traditional ways. Jason Rosenfeld, PhD, is a distinguished chair and professor of art history at Marymount Manhattan College. He is a senior writer and editor at large for the Brooklyn Rail. We are currently experiencing some technical difficulties, so Jason will open with some, some remarks. So Jason, please take it away. Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, for this discussion with Eddie Martinez. We're just sorting out some technical uh, issues on his end. So I'm gonna fill some air time, but um, I, I appreciate everyone showing up and I, it will be great conversation. Eddie right now has a show up at Mitchell Innes and Nash, which we'll be talking about hopefully at length and in depth um today uh i'd like to thank in right now in advance i thank cal and fong um and uh, nick for setting all this up i'd like to also thank um elizabeth robert and josephine from the gallery for all their help in making this possible today um and also uh, ali black who will be joining us later our distinguished poet of the day it's it's a great time for poets with um with uh, yet another fantastic Amanda Gorman performance last night at the Super Bowl. She's commanding the universe right, right now. If you check out the cover of Time Magazine, you can see her in resplendent uh, form and uh, what she calls uh, self-expression and regality in a yellow uh, outfit, yellow dress, which of course channels the yellow jacket she, which she wore at um, President Biden's inauguration on January 20th. It's a photograph on Time Magazine by uh, Awal Arizku. Uh, wonderful image by that conceptual artist and photographer. Um, I just actually taught a three-hour class about that in the Renaissance right now for, for my Marymount students just before this. Um, I think we're getting Eddie up and running, but I wonder if in the meantime, Phyllis Tuckman would would be willing to talk just for a couple of minutes about her role in the exhibition, Phyllis Tuckman, um, putting her on the spot, uh, editor at large um, and the author of the essay, fine essay called Always Present or Always Present, I guess you could say it two different ways, in the catalog for Eddie's new show, um, which is called uh, Inside Thoughts, um, the exhibition at Mitchell Innes and Nash. And uh, Phyllis wrote the catalog essay. So Phyllis, maybe we can unmute Phyllis. Uh, Cal and she, she and I could chat for a minute until Eddie's come up. Hi, Jason. How are you? Good afternoon. Oh my God, I love Eddie. I love Eddie's work. I think it's terrific you're doing this. Uh, I think the show looked tailor made for that space. Yeah. It, it, it's just, and the range of Eddie's work color, black and white, uh, the white out, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty great, right? So what's your, how did you get involved with Eddie? What's your first experience of him? And his um, work? Eddie asked me, uh, Eddie asked the gallery to uh, contact me to uh, write the catalog. And mm -hmm. what was thrilling for me in a way as a, a trained art historian, as you are, um, was that no one had ever gathered everything together. And it was just 
a, an incredible opportunity to uh, go from beginning to end and even had a little bit of a Robert Rosenblum moment, being able to talk about his background outside of art, being yep. able to talk about how Monet had begun so as a character, a okay. character. So yeah. 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 yeah, I like that part. I mean, you and I both are great disciples of Robert Rosenblum and that way that you kind of interweave the history of art into it. That's of course, totally part of my MO and how I work. So I appreciated those notes about, you know, caricature that Eddie started off doing uh, doodles and caricature and graffiti, um, and then transform that into what we think of as fine art. Although the, the boundaries are of course very blurred, but there's a long tradition in art history of artists doing that. Um, so I, th I thought it was really effective. Here we have the man of the moment and you're lucky because the Australian Open is uh, sleeping right now. Yes, yes, the Australian Open. That was not on my radar today. I but it should be on. Uh, it was well, on Eddie's. Why it am was I on looking Eddie's. at the camera? <laughs> Eddie is with us. Eddie, I think we Eddie is a big tennis fan, as you'll see. Can or cannot? Everyone hear. will see. Can you hear me? We can yeah. hear you. All right, here we go. <laughs> OK. I Ladies thought. and gentlemen, please welcome Eddie Martinez. Um, Eddie, Phyllis Tuckman and I were just chatting a little bit about the new exhibition. Um, welcome to the new social environment number 229. I'm coming to you live from the West Village and Eddie's coming to you live from Brooklyn, correct? Yeah. Queens. Oh, Queens, my bad. I'm sorry. Obviously, I haven't been to this, haven't been to the studio yet, but we're very pleased that you're uh, joining us today on what is now becoming a, quite a bright day out in New York City. Um, Eddie, as, uh, as Cal mentioned, um, was uh, was uh, born in 1977. Uh, interestingly, on the Groton Naval Base in uh, in Connecticut, is that a Franny sighting in the background? Yeah, yeah, Franny, yeah. Franny's here. Politics. Franny, <laughs> Franny's in the house. If you watch, and I encourage you to watch the two Art 21 videos, PBS videos about Eddie, you will also see Franny uh, in there and them roaming around the neighborhood. Um, he grew up uh, all over, as Phyllis writes about in her essay in the catalog, um, in Brooklyn, California, Florida, Texas, Massachusetts. Everyone does a little bit of time in Massachusetts, I feel like. Did one year in San Francisco, three years in San Diego. Spent some time hanging out at the uh, John and Marble Ringling Museum of Art in Sarasota, Florida, which is on my list. That's on like my art history bucket list as a place to visit uh, someday. They have an incredible work by Edward Byrne Jones of the Sirens. Do you remember that one, Eddie? I'll show that to you later and see if it jogs your memory. Um, Edward Byrne Jones, of course, the great Pre-Raphaelite, the greatest movement of the 19th century. Um, it was on loan to the Met in 1998. And I was wondering if that had any impact on you. Anyway, uh, Eddie in high school decided he wanted to be an artist, uh, was doing graffiti through his early 20s, um, was briefly in art school in Boston um, worked as an art handler at the ICA in Boston, where I expect he came in contact with a lot of great art. Um, and then at the Rose Art Museum at Brandeis University, um, was back and forth to New York City. And you've lived now in New York City, am I correct, since May 2004? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was here before that, but then I left for a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. And you've come back. And this show right now at Mitchell, Innes, and Nash is your, how many shows have you shown? done with the uh, gallery. Third. This is your third, right. Yeah. Okay, so let me start the um, share screen and the presentation, which we lovingly put together as usual. And you can get a sense of what we're looking at. Um, very dramatic photos of us. I, I always like to go a little over the top when we're actually just normal people. Um, yeah, exactly. It's like it's, it's like it's Sir Joshua Reynolds painting. <laughs> so here's the uh, promo from the uh, gallery. The, the work is called, the, the show is called Inside Thoughts, 434 West 26th Street through February 27th. So you have plenty of time uh, to see it, just under three weeks, scheduled by appointment. Lots of appointments available. Of course, it's free, um, but there's a lot of intellectual inquiry that is demanded of you when you get in the space. And the works look really beautiful in the space. They navigate the uh, columns really well. There's some great sight lines. Um, but the first vista that you get when you go in is this one in the first room that confronts you. 
after the, um, the attendance desk. And it's this image of uh, three works that you see here, uh, all of which are titled The Deal, but then they have uh, subtitles. And there are three works which, as you'll see, uh, form a kind of a triptych, but they're separate canvases. Um, the one on the left, the deal black and white, the middle, the deal muted, and the deal Eve Klein blue at the right. Now, Eddie, you, did you hang them in this sequence that you see here in the gallery? Uh, yeah. What okay. <laughs> I mean, in this or orientation. So the most colorful work there in the middle. Oh, I flipped, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, flipped it a little bit. Decided what piece would be on the, the wall that you saw when you walked in, and then we placed the other two. Right, right. So the first thing, the first work you see, as everyone should know, is that you come in from the right. So you see the black and white work first, um, and then you turn the corner and you see the other two works. Um, the compositions are obviously just about the same uh, to a degree. There's a little yeah. variations. Um, I also want to call to people's attention. Uh, the variations in, sorry, the, the painting style. So it's really important um, to get up close and look at these, uh, you know, take advantage of your access to the objects. And you can see, you're just mentioning the Australian Open, apparently you're a tennis aficionado, um, that the tennis balls that you see here uh, are all very different, the three tennis balls in this work. So maybe talk about these works a little bit in terms of uh, where you are now in in terms of your art making paintings at this moment in your career uh you said you were going to ask me questions that's yeah question. i'm not going to ask you but I can't. no one wants to hear me talk all day they want to hear you your... ask me like you want to talk about the tennis balls that's fine no we'll, we'll get to that in a second i guess I, let's talk about why you're working in a kind of seriality in these works oh i always do that um mm -hmm. it's just uh I just think it's interesting. There's always so much more to do. You know, you don't want to put everything in the same painting. Um, mm -hmm. So I like the idea of, I just treat them like pieces of paper and drawing. So I just like the idea of being able to sort of try out different things and palettes and strokes and ways of mark making and, but using the same composition basically. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I like working in, ser in series as well. Uh, I've been doing that for a long time. I think it's just, uh, well, A, it's good if you're lazy and you don't want to come up with something new all the time. Mm -hmm. And B, uh, I don't know if there's a B. <laughs> well, how, how do you get the starting composition in all three of the canvases? What's the process that leads you to have that these, the same oh. compositions? Drawing, I make the drawing. And then none of these have silkscreen. A lot of right. paintings I've made over the last several years do, um, mm -hmm. but these three don't. So I just put the drawing on the canvas, mm -hmm. uh, you know, brush and black ink. And then, okay. not ink, I'm sorry, uh, paint. And then, um, then I just go from there. Are you just eyeing it, Eddie, or do, are you using a projector? Both, mostly eye. Okay. Certain elements I want to kind of keep in the same scale. Right. And does it come from an initial smaller drawing? We'll look at some of that in other parts of the show, but does this composition come from a smaller drawing? Yes. Okay. So uh, people should understand, I, I'm sort of deliberately not going back and going through your whole career because I, I would really like to just focus on this exhibition and sort of point out things to people and have people sort of, have you sort of reveal your process to people as we go. Um, but Eddie tends to work in the small in the form of drawings and then these get expanded uh, into paintings. I'll show you this image uh, in a little while of his exhibition that was at the drawing center, which looked amazing. And is one of those shows that I can tick off as the show that I was stupid to have missed in New York city. And I'm sorry, I missed it. Um, but you know, the idea of drawing as the inceptive mode and then expanding these works as you see fit um, and then experimenting with color uh, and texture. And the thing that it made me think of was this suite of paintings by Henri Matisse um, which I'm sure you know. So, you know, how, how, particular. 
Okay, so he did a lot of this early in his career where he was sort of experimenting with different modes of seeing and in fact, different styles. So on the left, Matisse 1904, still life with Poro, Poro, which is this, this a jug, the jug that you see here, which also, uh, other, this one here, sorry, which also Picasso painted, uh, famous sort of Spanish style jug. Um, and then with other still life elements. And then the next, within the next year, he painted the version on the right which is a more fauvist approach, meaning more and more non-naturalistic color, less impressionistic use of Cezanne's Tosh, um, more of a broken uh, brushwork, um, something akin to a kind of maybe wayward pointillism or neo-impressionism, but really a kind of, uh, almost a kind of experiment or a kind of uh, attempt to work out different problems with vision using different styles. Um, so I was wondering I mean, I how much of an- Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just wondering how much of an impact Matisse has had on you and, and oh, how, what commonality you see in this. Well, I don't know these two, I mean, they're amazing paintings, um, but I was just gonna say that I, I liken it to music, you know, when artists do a whole record of variations of the same song or someone like the Grateful Dead made a whole career of performing mm. different songs and different moods and different you know influences of chemi chemicals and <laughs> whatever they would just do the same song in so many different ways and I just think it's fascinating and so I don't see any difference or any reason why you can't do that with painting mm -hmm. um, I mean that's basically what Matisse is doing here I think it's incredible mm -hmm. um, it's a bit like what Dylan does in concert, right? Dylan has taken yeah. his catalog and just changes the song. They become unrecognizable, but that's his want because he owns it all. He's done it all. Yeah. Well, he doesn't own a lot of it anymore, um, the catalog, but he, but he, they're his creations. Make enough money on that, in my opinion. <laughs> Three hundred million was not good enough. Yeah, he should have held out. Whole catalog. For sure. Crazy. I know it's crazy. I, I just, I don't know. I guess he had a number, and then they said okay. And then what was he going to do? <laughs> but you know that idea of the artist who, and you've shown that throughout your career, the kind of freedom to move back and forth between monochrome and color and gesture and smoothness. And that's why I put up this detail of the tennis balls because it really struck me, um, you know, the extraordinary range of variation that you can get into. So how do you, just looking at these details, you know, how are you thinking about the way that you're applying paint in each of these three? Well, I don't think about it. I just do it. Mm -hmm. uh, after, you know, now in retrospect, I can see what was happening. Um, the middle one, you know, the black line work went down and then I went over it really quickly with a, a thinned out oil and just sort of let it pool and puddle in areas. And then uh, the one on the left, you know, it's just black and white. I guess it looks like the white, it looks like I applied the white both before and after the black based on mm. the white coming in on the lines in the center of the ball. Yeah. And then on the far right one, there's that little booger of paint on there, probably just flicked on there. Mm -hmm. um, that's a looser, I mean, that's also a thinned out oil. It's a little thicker and it's more opaque. Um, yeah. And that looks like I just went around the, the lines of it, like a coloring book mm -hmm. with the yellow. And the one in the center, you're splattering it with yeah, the blue that's again? not intentional. That's the, um, that's probably just from like slapping the blue around because I go in afterwards for the background. Yeah, right. And that's probably just getting slapped around. And then that half circle on the left would be literally like the can of paint sitting on the painting. <laughs> this bit here. Yeah, I've watched it. it. Would you, you would do these on the floor then? Uh, I don't like to do it on the floor just because, uh, you know, it's uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. So I'll do yeah. it either on a, a flat parts, I'll do on a table. Okay. Um, otherwise, they're sort of leaning or hanging on the wall. Yeah. That's really interesting about doing it on the table because, as everyone will see shortly, there's one fabulous work called Oceanic, Oceanic, which is a tabletop, literally oh, yeah. tabletop, yeah. a motif that you've worked with throughout your career, but to actually working on the table. Um, uh, Heim Steinbach was uh, interviewed by Tom McGlynn last week on the rail, and he was talking about the transition from 
doing paintings to doing counter, you know, shelves. And yeah. that the shelf then became a surface for, uh, as if it was a canvas, as if it was canvas. And I think about that a lot when I'm looking at your pictures, right. that idea of a, a tabletop surface. Very but these, go ahead, sir. Uh, just saying it's very meta. Mm. Mm. Not knowing where, what ends and what begins and it's all the same thing. So that's part of the thrown on the viewer in a way to kind of orient yourself as all these objects appear, especially in the middle one to kind of defy gravity. Like they sort of hover in space. And there's a little bit of a horizon line at the bottom of the middle one. Yes. The thing that I find so fascinating about these is that they read so differently, each of them. I mean, anytime you get involved in something like on the right, Yves Klein, Klein Blue, and for those of you who don't know, Yves Klein is a French artist. Uh, who actually trademarked a particular shade of blue, which he used in his works, very distinctive. Um, and, you know, it has a particular tone and depth and Eddie's sort of using it here. Is this actually Eve Klein blue that you're using the paint? Oh, no, I didn't know you could actually <laughs> get that. It must be like a powdered pigment or something. <laughs> I think you can. Oh, Maybe no. Maybe someone can just, correct uh, us in the chat. I don't even know, if, you know, how accurate that is, but it just, it's what I felt. Yeah, at the time. Yeah. Well, I think you're one of the greatest purveyors of blue, I have to say. I mean, looking at your work and looking through your catalog, the use of blue, I mean, ever since Giotto, who I was just teaching an hour ago um, for my Marymount class, you know, when Giotto claimed blue in the Arena Chapel, I mean, artists have used it so effectively and um, affectively for backgrounds and you use it, you know, judiciously, but in a way that conveys to me a, a great deal of depth and almost emotional tenor in a sense. Yeah, this that particular use there seems stormy and, you know, it's so mm. dark, it's almost black in areas. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe it's because I like the Smurfs growing up. Yeah, um, that's legitimate, I think. <laughs> that's not that blue. That blue is probably somewhere in the middle one. But um, yeah. no, blue <laughs> is definitely moody. I think in yeah. the blues and the uh, the object here objects here you know are prosaic things everyday things but you know the way that you use them as Phyllis Wright says almost like in repertory in your work that creep them again and, and again and again um and I can see a lot of stuff here and you need to correct me like there's a tennis ball obviously there are a couple playing cards yeah. but weirdly they're aces, both diamonds, but different colors, like they're from mismatched decks. Um, a plant here in a planter, which is a little hard to see. I couldn't tell if this was like a ham from the Flintstones or an avocado blown, made huge. It's all hard to thing. say. And it's an oversized gambling chip, backgammon yeah. chip, and sushi. Sushi as well, right? And then this sort of overlay of a chessboard on a face, on a head. Lots of heads. Yeah, like sort of Farnham and Bailey uh, thing in the background. What would you call the flags, the string of flags? Yeah, yeah, the bunting or the, the yeah. decorative flags that they use in, in, in that kind of thing. Yeah, you see that here hanging there or at a racetrack. Yeah, there's such a wonderful range of objects and they creep up again and again. And then the you know, more time that you spend in the, in the exhibition and with the work, you learn to recognize them. So go ahead to the next suite of works. So here is an example of what we were talking about. So the work on the right is quite small. This is the drawing, which was the initial work. And, and you know, how many of the drawings would you say end up becoming larger compositions? Oh, I don't know. That's very difficult to say. I mean, I draw a lot. Um, I guess the only way would be to count the paintings and then assume that yeah. some came from drawings. <laughs> yeah, but so you draw all the time? So, yeah, mm. but I don't make them as preparatory sketches for the paintings. Okay. I'll just like I probably made that drawing on my couch and then thought, oh, let me try and make a painting out of it. And that's where we got these. And you'll just eye it to make it bigger, to, to yeah. expand it. Yeah. And mostly, yeah. And you're using like thick black Sharpies for the drawing on the right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you 
just do them when you're watching tennis or hanging out, idling around. Is that a nighttime activity? It's an all the time. Uh, yeah. I don't really draw here at the studio. I mean, occasionally, but it's not really what it's about for me because I'm generally alone and it's usually about helping me uh, navigate a conversation or a situation. That's mm -hmm. what drawing will do for me. Um, oh, I see. I see. So I usually do it socially, honestly, or alone on my couch or with my family. Mm -hmm. Do people ever think you're drawing them? Often. <laughs> but it's usually not the case. No, except for Fran. I draw Fran a lot. But she doesn't okay. know about it. She knows to keep it. Ah, you'll have to point her out in the pictures because now that, now that we're in search of Franny. Okay. Yeah, I think there's a there's a wonderful translation of the immediate energy in those drawings, which are pretty small, seven by nine inches, um, to these big scale paintings, and they haven't lost any of their sort of act activeness or vitality. That's just luck, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's why it's called the deal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so here's the view, as promised, of the show at the drawing center. Um, called Studio Wall. And I, I, as I said, didn't didn't see the show, but can you just explain a little bit? These are all original drawings that are just taped attached to the wall? Yeah, yeah, they're just drawings from the studio, literally from my studio wall, um, mm -hmm. their thumbtack. I mean, that's at the time, I don't have that set up right now. I need to do that again, I just haven't. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, that's how I would bring drawings in from home, usually in just like shopping bags tote bag yeah. and pin them up on the wall and a lot of them have paint all over them because I would just walk around with them while I was making paintings and they would fall on the floor and get stepped on and stick to mm -hmm. paintings and things like that and mm -hmm. uh, when I was originally introduced to Claire Gilman the curator at the drawing center she saw the drawing wall and it just kind of went from there. It turned into an exhibition, like let's bring the studio wall into the, the museum. And mm -hmm. then she wanted to hang some paintings over it as well to kind of basically flatten out what she saw in the studio, I think, where she would yeah. see paintings and then in the background, this wall of drawings. And so then we just made it a one dimensional thing. Huh. And so this is a painting down to the lettering on the stationery from yeah, the gallery. Yeah. yeah. Are you are you doing that by hand or stenciling it? Oh no, that's silkscreen. Silkscreen. Sorry, silkscreen. Yeah. So is any of the rest of this picture a silkscreen? Under there, not in that particular painting. There's, I, it's completely obliterated. But there was okay. originally a silkscreen drawing on there. Ah, okay. But it's you gone. just painted over. Layers and layers. The thing left is the letters. Mm, mm. And then the that little signature. Sometimes. There's no there's no formula. I just okay. start off with a silkscreen drawing sometimes. And if it remains, it's cool. If not, it doesn't matter. Right. Right. Yeah, I think this is a, a great way to kind of get into your creative mind, in a sense, to enter a space as if it's the studio walls, just covered yeah. with all these I ideas. Mean, really happy and proud of that exhibition. I thought that um, really did what it was supposed to do. And I was, I was really excited about it. Mm -hmm. It's got a really nice catalog too. Of course, they always produce beautiful yeah. catalogs. I love the scale of those catalogs. Yeah, every artist I've worked with her always said they love the drawing center, both the shows and the catalog. Cecily Brown always talked about that. She, that was one of her favorite shows and the catalog is so amazing. Yeah, it's the best. I mean, Claire has a lot to do with that. Yeah. Experience. Yeah. So here's one of the, what I thought were standout works in the exhibition. This one is untitled from 2020. So um, this is the entire picture for everyone watching. It's 72 by 108 inches, uh, oil, acrylic, and spray paint on canvas. Um, it's possibly a little bit more legible than a lot of the other works in a sense. Um, you see three figures and some I don't know what this is, hanging element. It looks to me like a chicken, but that's just me. Um, Honestly, with, uh, it looks like Fran. <laughs> like what? It looks like, oh, like Fran. An abu above view of her on the couch. Aha. Fran, Fran, Franny recumbent on the couch from yeah. above. Yeah. In repose. Yeah. Yeah. And st still life elements here 
on the what is ostensibly a tabletop, but uh, like in modernist works from the late 19th, early 20th century, it could be up or down. And then a crumpled up newspaper here on the left. And I love the way that you have this sort of variety of different heads and they're giving you expression with their closed eyes and the person on the right with the, the folded up arms. Um, and then that brilliant use of a kind of mustardy yellow in the background. So this is a composition that you've, that you've came a little bit sort of out of a drawing, right? But it's not so direct. No, I mean, I don't know that that's even, that's maybe, this, this would be a composition that uh, a lot of drawings happens around. You know, also okay. sometimes even once it becomes a painting, I keep drawing it a lot. Um, so I don't know that this was, well, I mean, I guess it probably is, I don't know. But I've made this painting, variations of this painting a few times. Um, mm -hmm. I made one slightly smaller that was fairly similar. I mean, very similar, even with the yellow. Um, the yellow is important to me for this composition. I'm not sure why, but I showed mm -hmm. that uh, Detroit MoCAD a couple of years mm -hmm. ago. And then I made a small one that was 30 by 40 inches that I showed in San Francisco last year. And then I made this one. Mm -hmm. And the figures each have such a distinctive identity. Yeah. Football helmets. Um, they're more of, like, I think they're high, more as like space helmets. Like, like, jo like a Boba Fett kind of helmet. Uh, okay. Yeah, sci-fi element. Yeah. And then these really hieroglyphic sort of faces. But there's so much of an interest in, uh, you know, different kinds of active uh, application of paint, uh, more brushy sort of impasto at the top and the left. And yeah. then this more fluid elements there. The canvas is primed white, but there's still a little bit of weave that's evident when you uh, prep, prime, prepare these. Oh yeah, I don't cake it on or anything. Um, mm -hmm. I used to, you know, when I was younger and I was really young, I don't know. <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I was just like, you can't see the duck of a canvas, that's insane. So I would just put like 50 coats of gesso on the fucking thing and it would become a big rock. And then I would paint yeah. it. Now I just couldn't care less. And so yeah. I do and like the, particular types of canvas and, you know, counts and everything. Um, but I don't rely on the gessoing part of it to create the texture. Cause I know that mm -hmm. I'll be able to do that uh, suitably with just painting. Right, right. And if you if people watch the Art Twenty One films, you'll they'll see you painting with gloves and with really thick paint, really heavy application of paint, and that's not something that you're pursuing anymore now. And you're in terms of surfaces. I mean, I would get you know that brown up on top there was most likely applied with my hand. Yeah. Oh, okay. But it's not. It's not something I rely on. Yeah, I relied on it to complete the pictures and feel like, you know, it was hitting the marks that the last one did. And I just don't mm -hmm. think like that anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. Just look at another couple of the heads. This one's great with a sort of pot-like helmet on its head. Yeah. Like from Little Rascal movie, yeah, TV exactly. show. <laughs> yeah, the little snarky kid there with his arms kind of crossed. Phyllis mentions Fayum portraits, those uh, Roman sort of portraits in, oh, from yeah. Egypt, Roman Egypt, which have such a startling kind of intensity and power of naturalism, and these little weird mummies um, that they painted them on with encaustic and other medium. But you still get a real sense of personality, despite obviously these are quite abstract faces and abstract heads that you see here. Yeah. People are asking in the chat about the impact of Philip Gustin on your work. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if I you want to speak to that at all, <laughs> well, obviously, Augustine is the man. Um, the impact, uh, I don't know how to simplify mm. that. Um, mm. It's like, you know, who was I just trying to think of? Who are the who did the strokes sound like when they first came out? I don't remember, but or it's like Bob Dylan and Woody Guthrie, or I, yeah. I don't know, you can't get away from it. The yeah, it's just completely 
owns so much of what we're seeing and have seen and will continue to see. Yeah. Um, he's amazing. I, I just think he's really incredible. It's amazing that there's a whole controversy, obviously, about his exhibition that was canceled and now reinstated. We had a whole new social environment about it. And despite that, I think still he is the artist that so many contemporary artists cite as a most formative, having the most formative impact oh, yeah. on them for the last Anyone eight years. Anyone who can see that would say that. Even a lot of people that you wouldn't see it would say that. Right. People that are making like super tight geometric abstractions or something like that would still be like, Gustin's one of my favorite painters. This is really interesting, right? Feel. I mean, he has that iconoclastic punk fuck you thing too, where he did, yeah. uh, you know, where he just turned everything upside down when he started doing the cartoons and pissed everyone yeah. off. Um, yeah. That's amazing. That level of freedom, right? I think that's something that a lot of artists um, really sort of connect with, that it ballsy, and then it gave him the freedom to do such new things in his yeah. art. Yeah. And also the way that you're talking about it, it's interesting because I think the compositions, uh, the, his caricatures and these sort of cartoonish nicks and drawings and that kind of thing, he appeals on so many different levels, um, not just in terms of the kind of cartoonishness of the Klansman imagery. Oh, the and Nixon then, stuff's amazing. It really is, I know, it really is. They had that show at Hauser and Worth a couple of years that ago. Was incredible, with all the white all, out and everything still on the page. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about you and the way that you do the whiteout and canceling, you, you know, covering over things that he was doing that all that kind of stuff before oh, yeah. and fiddling with it. And I went to Duke University, so he always shows Nixon with Duke banners and pennants and, oh, yeah. because he went to Duke Law School and, and, he, and he sort of implicate them in, in all of it. It's quite extraordinary. So here's one uh, painting that this work immediately made me think of when I saw it in the gallery oh, and just to wonder if you were, if, you know, this is not about influence, I think. It's more about, you know, the way that um, artists share a, a, a common sort of state of mind. So Gauguin's The Meal Bananas, 1891 at the Musée d'Orsay, which is such a strange painting. I remember Linda Nochlin talking about it a lot in classes with her at the Institute of Fine Arts, because in one, on one level, it's this kind of childlike view of the world. These kids where the table's so high up and they're sitting really down low, you know, as if they're subsumed by it. Um, and then the size of the still life elements and the threatening quality of them, the knife pointing right towards the bowl and the girl, these red bananas there. Um, and then in the background, a sort of mysterious figure hovering in the background. And I think there's a similar sensibility that I get from your picture on the left. Actually, I didn't, yeah, that, that, I mean, I see it completely now, obviously. Um, yeah. Posing shadow of the oversized bananas is pretty amazing. Yeah, right. It, it has a kind of almost an animated quality, human form. Yeah, bananas are incredible. Yeah, lurking there. Yeah, I mean, Gauguin is a problematic figure. We're struggling with him and how to teach him and art history and his personal history. And, you know, he raped underage children in Polynesia. Um, but the power of the art is something that yeah, you have to come to terms with in a that. sense. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the, the, a painting like this gives you a kind of uh, a kind of approach to the world, which I see quite similar in your picture on the left and the floating element, which, you know, whether that's the dog or, or whatever, oh, and the way that... Uh, similar, it's amazing. Yeah. It's got a, it's a, a, a same feel to it in a way. Obviously not. I mean, that painting is really cool, but the way they're like... Right kind of floating in space, but still at the same time and looking mm -hmm. in different directions like that, it's wild. Yeah, there's no connection amongst the three of them at all. It's and it's like, like the still life elements in the foreground. Yeah, it's like, you know, back when in the 80s and 90s when people would have lots of people over for dinner uh, and the kids would always get put, sent to a different table so they could all drink and whatever. And <laughs> that would yeah. be kids that didn't even know each other a lot of the time. Yeah. Kind of like that. And they had, they didn't want to talk to each other. They had nowhere to connect. And now, of course, when you have the kids' table at Passover or whatever, they're just all on their phones, just all on their yeah. iPad. Yeah. <laughs> they have the phone. <laughs> so, Oceanic, talking about tabletops and thinking about that Gauguin. Um, you know, this is a, a Titanic work in the exhibition. 
I think. And it's, it's um, you know, something where you're using the blue again, but all different shades of blue and this compelling element of the tabletop. And, you know, I'm not here to divine what each individual element is, but what is this, the fascination with the tabletop? Um, and, you know, something we see so consistently in your art and I'll show in a minute other examples. Well, that, you know, I mean, that, that's just sort of an everyday thing, shit getting thrown on a table, even if you don't want it to happen. And then you have to clear it when it comes time for a meal. Yeah. You know, your mail and your keys and everything else. Um, mm -hmm. But originally, uh, when I started making those, I don't know, 15 years ago, I guess, um, it was just about consolidation and about, um, yeah, there's an old one. It was about a container for putting shapes and colors and lines in. And mm -hmm. it's always about feeling like I needed, I was, I was doing myself a disservice by not just trying to make abstract pictures and just really feeling like I needed to do abstraction. And so the tables were the, the original um, sort of answer to that problem for me, even though the, most of the things in there are representational or figurative and you can particularly in that drawing on the right, you can really see what a lot of stuff is. It felt free to me like abstraction at that time. And now mm -hmm. on the left, it's much more abstracted. Um, yeah. But it's something that using a shape like that as a container is something that I keep returning to. I, I made a series of, um, that one, yeah. These mandala paintings. It's, you know, it's just like creating this environment and then having the freedom of a maximalist environment and then being able to have the background be a minimalist, just like a mm -hmm. block of color is really satisfying to me. Hmm. It reminds me of like Renaissance ceiling paintings where you had called Quadratura, like the Karachi did, where on the ceiling, they would have these great compositions, which were not about um, making the ceiling seem like it stretched into infinity, that would come later. But instead, they were like framed paintings on the ceiling, mm -hmm. which then almost felt like they could be moved around, shifted around. And it. especially the one on the right here, it feels like the table is a canvas in a way, has become the canvas uh, for all these different elements, designs, forms, that interact with each other, irrespective of perspective or scale or size or depth or dimension. And that the tabletop, you know, it's becoming more and more almost like a, uh, a drive-in movie screen, you know, sort of standing up in yeah, your vision. Like a billboard too. Yeah, like a billboard, exactly. That sort of billboard aesthetic, but without the, you know, you're, you don't want the clarity of Rosenquist and that kind of billboard style. You want the messiness. Uh, which is, I, I'm looking around my dining room table right now. This is the bane of my wife's existence um, because I'm at home working here and it's just always such a mess. And then I pile things up in places. And my mom used to say my, my files have become piles and I know where everything is, but it doesn't look aesthetically very nice. Um, but the tabletop that all of yours wonderful tables made me think of was this artist. Oh, Saul Steinberg. Yeah, he's amazing. Yeah. And these tabletops, which then he, of course, realized in actual sculptures of his own tabletops, um, which once in a while they show at Pace Gallery. Um, this one called Mille, and then the bottom, if you look closely, it says Mille 1814 dash, as if he never died, uh, right? Which, of course, he lives on in cultural memory. But the central thing here is the Long Island duck, <laughs> which Robert Venturi made famous um, in writing about it. And uh, then you have, you know, always cigar boxes, uh, records. And here, very small detail is the Angelus, which is Millet's very famous painting of this couple praying at the end of the day in their field and other figures. It, it, the Angelus here recurs again. But uh, Steinberg, right? Steinberg and oh. Gustin. Steinberg and Gustin, maybe those are the two most important artists um, of their period. Steinberg also constantly a fascinating. Escher feel to it. A what kind of feel? MC Escher. Mm. Right. But without, but you know, Steinberg, you just feel like you're in his head all the time. And he's drawing himself in all of these in such an interesting way. And he treats the tabletop in a similar way, he even has a 
turntable there, so a table on a table. Oh yeah. Oh, oh that's good. I love that. Let me show a couple of details so people can get a sense of the, the surface that you're working with here um, in Oceanic. These little bits of paint, like wads of gum, which show up once in a while. And then such a blend of, of surface. So how, I always ask artists this, you know, how do you, how do you get to the point where you're satisfied with the work? That's what Tom Nozkowski used to say. Um, he would be satisfied with the work and he could stop. How do you get to the point where you feel like it's it's finished as a painting? Uh, I mean, there's no overall answer to that. Every painting is different. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Sometimes I it'll come because I'm sitting there redrawing it or or thinking of things that I would add, but it mm -hmm. seems unnecessary, or just doing it anyway, and then realizing it was a mistake and then removing it and then saying, okay, it's done. Or it's just a gut feeling. Yeah. Sometimes I'll put the signature on there first, even though I'm not certain it's done, just to feign that it's done and see if I feel, if I believe that or not. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, man. It's like, it's the hardest part. So I think that I just do whatever I need to do to figure it out for each individual painting. Right. It's so different than for writers like us, like me, you know, we, we have a word limit, you get to the word limit, you pass the word limit, then you have to go back and get it down to the word limit. You know, in a way there's a push and pull, but you always have a kind of limiting factor. I always wonder that about artists. I mean, you're so interesting you start from these drawings. So you start from an initial conception, but you don't have a final goal in mind when you're painting, right? Because oh. some artists will tell you they can see what it needs to look like at the end. And then it's the process of getting there. Hmm. Some landscape painters yeah, okay. um, I've spoken to. But for you, it, it just has to get to the right point where you feel like it, it works. Yeah, it's just intuitive. I mean, I have to feel it. Hmm. That's it. Yeah. What about this section here? This is sprayed on? Yeah, the gray is spray paint and that uh, sort right of periwinkle blue is spray paint. Mm -hmm. I really thought that was toilet paper, which <laughs> it didn't occur to me, but it really does seem like toilet paper. And with, you know, she said, that's oh, what I thought. The pandemic. <laughs> and then yeah. I was like, oh, toilet paper. And then also Puerto Rico when Trump was throwing paper towels, toilet paper at people. Um, but I think what I originally thought it was was a cup like a drinking cup with a straw like a fountain soda on its side and that green mm -hmm. is a straw but i don't honestly know what i thought it was so i think it is toilet paper yeah okay it's become that oh no you be, don't be influenced by the art historians we would we, never write <laughs> we don't even want to be clement greenberg like yeah, but I mean, you know, there's, I think the thing on the left is a is a loaf of bread, but who knows? It could be a football. It could be it could be football. anything. Really. I feel confident yeah. in saying it's not a football. It's not a football. Okay, it's too much football, right? You know, but I see where you say like poker chips and things like that. But it it doesn't really matter, and obviously in a way because it's not about decoding that. Instead, it's about um, you know, for me looking at it, trying to just understand it as a composition, trying not to see it because of the title as related to uh, Jerry Coe's Raft of the Medusa, which obviously is not, although it's raft-like in its form. Um, you know, these all these kinds of things, I just think it has a wonderful energy. And there's one more comparison I want you to look at, which is this one, because there is a segment there which just looks like excrement. It looks like shit. Uh, the color. And Cy Twombly, you know, Cy Twombly has also had such a impact on on practicing artists today. Um, what do you think of his stuff? Oh, uh, I think it's great. I mean, I, yeah, I, I think it's certainly influential. Um, he's not someone for me that I'm, I, I just don't really think about him, but obviously mm. my brain has recognized it and kind of stored it for later, but he's not mm. someone, I don't consider his whole thing like someone I, like Dustin or de Kooning or someone like that yeah um, yeah that just I don't know why that doesn't mean anything I I, I love what he does or did and, um, I particularly like the huge 
uh, triptychs. Obviously, his sculpture, though, his bronzes, I've been hugely influenced yeah. by. Um, yeah. But the paintings, I don't really ever think about. Mm, interesting. And their epic quality is not something that really is part of you, what you're doing on a, in any sense. Epic? You know, the way that he, epic in the way that he is, you know, trying to translate um, epic literature, Homer, myths, oh. um, struggle into a kind of modern idiom in his works. Um, you know, that, that you're interested, it seems to me, in the prosaic, in the, in the strange sort of power or charged power of everyday objects, you know, they come to life. Uh, the only, uh, I think of symbolist writers like Xavier Mellery, who talked about the secret life of inanimate things that, you know, the, the teapot has a quality that could be threatening or everything around you has a kind of animated nature and it. You're bringing it kind of stuff to life without dense psychology, I guess I would say. We're losing work. participants. No. They keep dropping. No, no, they're going to come back. <laughs> so tell us about that, this series of works, which you titled TBT. And this is a, this is a really a strong work in the show, I think. Thank you. I'm not sure that that's meant to be a title. Um, I think TBT means to be titled, but. It's not Throwback Thursday? <laughs> yeah, it's that. Um, OK. <laughs> To be titled. Okay, so but that's what it is in the that's what it is in the checklist. There's a yeah. number of TBTs. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak with Pam about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, maybe I did that. I don't know. It, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> that painting is fun for me. It's got. Uh, sorry, I just got distracted by a comment. I was trying not to look at it. Um, that painting's got like a real flattening out that I feel like a, a lot of other things are only mm -hmm. attempting to have. Mm -hmm. um, and, but you know, the figurative elements are really transparent. So it's hard to see what plane they're on, which I like a lot. Um, yeah. it's still sort of jigsaw puzzly, like a, like a Dubuffet. Um, yep. Dubuffet is someone that I really think about. Um, that sort of biomorphic sort of blobby shapes and forms yeah, and just his interest in general mm -hmm. like his interest in children's drawings and you know mm -hmm. mentally insane and uh, you know all his collection all that stuff yeah. um, and his sculpture which is the sculpture is pretty evocative the sculpture is cool yeah yeah works in a large scale too like the one at chase manhattan plaza downtown the trees did you just get paid for that no, 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 actually, we just divested from Chase, so that they're not, they don't have anything anymore, so get rid of no petrochemical stuff. Um, no, I just love that sculpture. I mean, I always thought his pictures were a little grotty and difficult, but that's part of the source of their strength, I think. Oh, yeah. And the way he translated it into these biomorphic um, sort of Dr. Seussian sort of wonderland forms yeah. was really great. Someone was asking about you know, their connection with animation in your work, and maybe that's a good place to talk about it a little bit. Do they mean cartoons? I guess so, yeah. I mean, I guess so, sort of uh, filmic animation or something like that. But it, or, or maybe the idea of, film, of stills, animated stills. There is such a you know, drawn quality to some of these works. And like you say, you can see things so clearly, like, I don't know, I read this as a hand holding a kind of balloon-like form yeah. here with yeah. that glossy sheen, you know, you kind of see it, but I don't, I don't feel like the works have a lot of motion in them. I don't know if you're going for that. Yeah. I mean, they, 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 they feel like they're still, they, they feel like they're, I don't know. My parents would use the word shuffling, like things are shaking, but they're not moving off camera. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Um, I think that Often I find people saying that they do feel like there's a lot of movement. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I, mm. I don't know. I, I'm not mm. trying to make them feel like they're moving or anything. I think it's just, um, I think it's just a result of the action of painting them. Action painting. Right. 
Yeah, because that is there clearly. The movement is there in the brushwork and the, the application of the paints. But whether you see them as discrete elements that are actually flaring around, I don't know. Have you ever worked with animation and film? No. No. Okay. I like cartoons, um, mm -hmm. but no, I've never worked with it. Okay. I, I brought out this little detail here of the center because I thought that was quite one, wonderful here. With this, I read as a kind of random drip. Yeah. And then as just part of your pro you start to highlight it and turn it into yeah, it's a, a punctum in a way. Yeah, I think that's really important. Mm. And people should notice those because it's so easy to just kind of try to find shapes that resemble things. But in fact, the paint itself becomes the shape. The paint becomes the subject yeah. uh, in the picture. And it's highlighted really well in that in that little section with this this kind of goldenrod drop. I have one more detail of TB, this TBT. Yeah, just of this area. Um, so we're all, someone's wondering in the chat if you work on a lot of different paintings at once. I do. I mean, but see on the I mean, left hand oceanic there, on yeah. the, the top right with you know that little brown thing, and then that's circled around. That's the exact same mechanism as the drip highlighting. Uh-huh. Oh, I see what you mean. No, yeah, no, so edge that, of the painting. Here. No, the top right oh, edge. Right. There's like a brown thing falling off the edge. In this part. No, if you were to take your cursor. <laughs> yeah. Edge of the actual painting, not the table. Oh, here I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's all okay. highlighting, moving around. These incidents, okay. these little incidents. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, yeah. and then that kind of screws up your whole sense of depth. And trying to read background. Yeah, but that's picture. important because it's the history of the painting. Yeah, yeah. Here's another one of these works. And this one, people were asking about uh, your use of heads in the works and skulls and heads in the paintings. And I think this one is a particularly vibrant example of that with these sort of conversing heads or skulls. And then uh, these discrete area of, of, uh, of paint of the you know, sort of solid paint almost in some of these sections. Yeah, that's a bird in the middle. This part here uh, or this? The yellow, the yellow beak. Oh, this yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a profile of like a parrot. Ah, I see. And, then and there's one there. this, yeah. yeah, now I see it there. Now I read it there. Interesting. And there's just so much to look at in these paintings and so much to kind of tease out in terms of the process. And I was looking at this section here and I was just at the Whitney and saw um, Franz Klein's Mahoning, which I think is his oh, greatest it's painting. Like a Franz Klein right there, yeah, you're right. This little section, but Mahoning is such a powerful, powerful image by him. He got it right in that. And I was just thinking, wow, this, that has a real power in it. It changes the way that you perceive the rest of the picture. Yeah. Here's also a couple of works that um, these made me think of. This, uh, these really strong de Koonings from the late forties in terms of the way that he's, you know, inserting heads into here. There are heads, there's a head here with an eye, that section, Asheville also, Asheville, especially at the bottom um, where it has this sort of play between the black and white, the monochrome and the color which comes forward or recedes. Yeah, that's a mind blowing painting. Yeah. De Kooning, I think also retains a kind of impact on gestural art making oh, yeah. um, okay. today. Did, did you see the show at MoMA, the huge retrospective oh, yeah, a few yeah. years? Yeah, I wonder my about favorite, that. People should do. My favorite part of Go. that show, I think was a, a lot of people's least favorite, which is those, those late sculptures. Uh, no, what the clam diggers? Oh, I hate the sculptures. I can't do it. I don't get it. I don't oh, really? get it. Help me with them. Help us all with the no, decoding sculptures. For sure. Right. Um, right. Oh. I don't, it's funny. I don't love the sculptures, but mm. definitely wouldn't say I hate anything that he made. Um, okay. But uh, that's just me. But I like those late, yeah. really open, heavily uh, dense white area paintings. It's, and it's like the mm. last room of the show. That was yeah, the, the ribbons, the ribbony pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. so good. Yeah, and then I remember seeing the, 
there's all the the um, conspiracy around if he made those or if he mixed mayonnaise with them or if he was yeah. uh, Alzheimer's, whatever. I don't know. It doesn't matter. I love those things. Yeah. It was interesting the way that they showed how so many of those seem to come out of earlier compositions. You know, that idea that he's sort of going back to earlier compositions and then treating them in this really very elegant, refined, but stripped down manner. I always like the ribbon paintings. Yeah, I agree. Sportsmanlike. This one seems a, a very different in its form from everything else we've been looking at. Closer maybe to some of the, the Matador series, yeah. the earlier works, That's true. more abstract works. But could you talk a little bit about the technique here and silk screening? Um, oh yeah, there's silk screen there. That, so, so like that, for example, this section here, right? Yeah, in the, you know, in the back. So that would have just come from a small drawing um, maybe like a, a, a little notepad sized piece of paper, mm -hmm. just to mark a Sharpie drawing and then um, silk screen enlarged to six by nine feet. And okay. then that comes to uh, the studio, stretch mm -hmm. it and then just go from there. And whatever happens, happens, it really doesn't matter. Um, it's just the beginning. It's just a skeleton. It's no different than the those paintings, the deal where I started with the black line drawing. It's no right. different. It's just okay. putting it on there. It's just a starting point. Um, and will you, you reuse the screen? Do you reuse them? No. Just one time. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool because you, you can you can see it it has this sort of edge it remind me of some of um you know these kinds of works that warhol was doing both oh, yeah. in earlier works and then later with that kind of uh, use of black and uh the distinction between i bet that was and white screen, though. i bet that was projected uh some of these yeah some of these were projected the early ones like the refrigerators he did he hand painted yeah, and projected and then he started using the silk screen but i think he's using a technique which is meant to look like to look like he's doing a mechanical sort of right silk screen technique yeah. people are asking if you're doing the screening yourself onto the canvas um no no, no it doesn't matter it doesn't matter production yeah. yeah to put that on there really amazing sportsman so here is okay oh sorry go ahead please the titles from um the princess bride ah andre the giant says sportsman like Classic. One of the great actors of our generation. <laughs> Did you see that devastating uh, documentary about him? I haven't watched it. I don't want to. I mean, I saw him wrestle live when I was in high school at the Spectrum in Philadelphia. I don't want to break up that it's image sad. of him. It's like, I mean, it, just showing him riding on airplanes and how fucking uncomfortable he was because of yeah. his eyes and. Um, yeah, he'd have to drink to get drunk, but he would do it. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's kind of yeah. sad. Fall down drunk. Interesting fate, character, sportsman. Like, all right, I'm gonna have to. I can't possibly rewatch the Princess Bride, Prince, but I'll try. I'll try just to get to that line. Um, let's just. Uh, we're gonna open it up to questions, okay, Eddie? But I just want to talk about this work, Untitled, and maybe share a little bit about you know how you've been coping with. Um, we've been asking a lot of artists this, coping with lockdown and the, um, and the uh, quarantine and, and you know, how you've been responding in your work to it, if at all. Aside from this painting, you mean? Yeah. It's just a general question. Um, just a general question, just because this is one of the, tr the newest works, the most recent work. Yeah, it's been uh, a long time. I think it's gotten really long in the tooth and old. Um, yeah. But you know, I'm lucky, really lucky. I, I you know, you know, my immediate family, no one's been sick, and um, I'm able to come to work every day and do what I do and play tennis. That hasn't really well. The that was affected for like yeah. three or four months. Couldn't play tennis, yeah. but um, I'm not a super. I wasn't like going out at all or anything before the pandemic. Really. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm not really, I just don't really do that. I'm not, 
majorly social and social and like you know playing backgammon or tennis and that sort of mm -hmm. way small mm -hmm. groups of people um but it's been a lot i mean i'm very um sensitive to what's going on around me and um what do you call that when you pick you really feel people's emotions and sense of empathy or pathos yeah, yeah. and so people. it's been a real it's been really sad to see how it's affected so many people um yeah. the homelessness going up is just like devastating joblessness i mean everything that's happening with um you know a lot of loss for a lot of people and a lot of setbacks yeah. for a lot of people and a lot of setbacks for progress um in general it's just fucking yeah it's just it's been a really heavy dark time in a lot of ways i think of course there are positives that have come out of it with people the world slowing down I mean, especially things like the art world, the, the microcosm of mm. people feeling like they need to be on a plane going all over the world every week to sell art. Right. Obviously, a lot of that stuff has changed. In that regard, I do hope that we, you know, that the brick and mortar art viewing experience does stay around forever because mm. I think it's really important. I think it's the original way to see art. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a general, a baseline anxiety that's come from it. Um, you know, we had a baby, he's 16 months now. So I guess he was like four months when this started. So that was really difficult for me in the beginning. I didn't want anyone around him. Um, I can't imagine having a baby right now, having to go to the hospital all the time. Uh, I think a lot about all this stuff. It all affects me in varying degrees. Um, the thing that I'm doing to cope is work, hang out with my family and play tennis. Yeah. That's what's getting me through it. Yeah. And well, just thank you so much. being grateful and yeah. you know, realizing the position. Um, realizing how lucky we are and, and feeling um, deeply for people that are not doing well. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. I think, you know, I feel the same. And I think, you know, the result is I feel a real human quality in your work. Um, it's very strong in this exhibit, in this exhibition, uh, both in terms of you physically being in it in terms of the making of it and also the human presence in it, which feels significant and, and sympathetic. Um, so it's there. Do you have to play tennis in a mask? No, you don't. Um, okay, you can, you can unmask. Uh, you don't have to do that. Yeah, you have soon to you'll be able to go outside again, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. So there's one political-ish work in the show. I don't know if you want to talk about it. But I found it pretty high, pretty humorous here. Yeah, man. One way to get through this. Yeah, that was <laughs> the beginning. Um, you know, when I wasn't able to come to the studio, I'm lucky enough to have a, a small studio at my house. So I was just going in there every day and doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And just so pissed off at that guy and just so angry. And the one thing that got me really upset was his incessant spinning of calling it the china virus and the chinese virus it was just it pissed me off so much i mean i work with a lot of chinese people and mm -hmm. uh you know they appreciate a lot of folks appreciate my work and collect it there and mm -hmm. i just hated that aspect of it. it just all that like gossipy bullshit around it and all the the fact denying and just the whole handling of it really made me angry um mm -hmm particularly in the beginning of it, when New York was just unrecognizable. Um, right. And so I was heavily into calling it the Trump virus because I wanted, I, I felt like that's what it was. And I, I thought that that's, if he's gonna call it the China virus, which 
Yeah. Doesn't even make sense. Um, <laughs> right. And so, yeah. yeah, I just wanted to white him out. I wanted him to be non-existent and disappear. <laughs> so that's what that's about. This is from a whole part of a continuing series by Eddie of these white out paintings where it's sort of canceling over lines. I don't say cancel in terms of cancel culture, but literally erasing over lines or covering up these lines that he's made. And it results in these spectral armatures, which are quite beautiful, but also are aggressive in a way, you know, the sense of, of, of pushing a, a past image out of the way. I know this one is, you have to, it's in the office, so it's not part of the full display. I think that makes sense because it doesn't really go with the rest of the works, um, but it's, it's a great, aesthetic documentation of your state of mind, which you could tell right away. And I always read it quickly, Trump versus Whiteout for some reason when I see the title as if he's in, he's losing, he's losing the battle. And now we can go whole days without hearing his name. It's amazing. I'm sorry I brought it up. No, just this morning, <laughs> Sam was like, oh, he's gone. We haven't heard shit. He's gone. He's out here. Go to Florida. Oh, Eddie, thank you so much for this okay. wonderful interview. I'm going to move back and I'm going to give it over to Cal. We have people who I'm sure want to ask questions. Um, sorry for the technological hijinks in the beginning. Um, yeah, thanks for the thanks for the Franny view, fr Franny appearance. And um, yeah, she's here. She's hanging out. And we appreciate your, your, your talking so honestly and beautifully about your work. So I'm going to step aside and let Cal handle the questions. But thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. Really appreciate it. Um, everything that you've, you've done today. Um, so first, we are going to hear from our publisher, Fong Bui. Fong, you can uh, unmute yourself. Thank you, Eddie. Hey, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for being so frank, so incredibly generous and casual about the work. You know, it's the last piece. It remind me so much of Gustin, also the the, the self portrait being caught at the Klansman in the studio. Oh yeah. So your is all white out. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously we don't need to go further, but <laughs> as Plato once say, one of the, the penalties for refusing to participate in, in politics is that you ended up being um, governed by your inferiors, you know? So I think we did well. But um, in regard to, to what you describe, uh, your reference, your your admiration to for Gustin for examining um, he his own reimagined Morandi intimate still life, which is so interesting because they're so tiny. There's a beautiful show right now at Devisona, um, pairing with Rosa Albert. Oh, really? That's cool. Yeah, it's it's definitely worth seeing because you realize how small those still lives are and how beautifully painted they were in a very slow, deliberate way, and not much painterliness as appear in reproduction, which is interesting. Oh. But um, as he did that, reconstitute, reimagine Morandi intimate still life, and it's often appear in his painting, particularly from you know, the last decade, 1970, and he died 1980, you can see that always a very strong horizontal line that resemble that still like construct because he had painted always straight direct eye level. You know, you never seen a, a painting look down upon. So that's interesting in, in terms of the consistent touch of the pen application, Eddie. I can see that also in your work. But your reference to the Kuhn is interesting because the Kuhn deployed both fast and slow. Yeah in terms of speed, you know, because he was trying to collapse both the cubic space and at the same time um, try to generate his own surrealist automatism. So you got two things going on with the cooling, which is interesting that you are somewhere in between. Uh, but in terms of speed of execution, which I think is essential, a movement in regard to the personal pace of the artist, quote unquote, inner rhythm, you know, and I feel that if you, you know, for those people who started out um, in, in the world of, you know, graffiti art, I know what I was told by Futura 2001, 
um, you know, many people we know, even um, Jean-Michel Basquiat, it's like, it's very territorial. When you make art outside in the train station in certain walls in the neighborhood, um, so it need to be very legible, that sense of movement, that's, you know, that speed of execution. So my, my question is very simple. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't go last because I need to go to a meeting. Is that not long ago, I reread um, Esker Yon, you know, one of the members of Cobra Group. He wrote this amazing piece, essay in the late 1930, maybe 39, it's called Intimate Banalities where he prays in the future of art will, will be deployed through Kish aesthetic and self-taught and amateur art being the best kind of art. It's so interesting. And look, <laughs> Eska Yon, I was not long ago in the Guggenheim where they hung that beautiful painting in the collection. It's called Green Ballet. And I'm asking you whether there is any kind of rapport with Yon simply not because he He's an anarchist, although he was. So he had one foot in um, Cobra and the other foot in, you know, situation is international. It's very political. But because of the claustrophobic, the way that Spain is being, you know, organized and deployed with rapid mark making and very bright color at times. So there is there any any consideration in terms of Keen looking at Asker Yorns at all, Addy? Love Asker. Yeah, I love Asker Yorn. Uh, I first uh, saw his work in 2009 in Denmark, of course, and um, just was blown away. And we were there for about a month. And so I pretty much threw myself into seeing as much and reading as much as possible about Asker Yorn. The Louisiana Museum has some really beautiful examples. Um, the Arkin Museum. They, I think it was the Arkin Museum um, had actually a, uh, a fresco. Is that like if it's painted on a wall, is that a fresco? Yes. Uh -huh. okay, so he, he, he famously, I guess, would go around. He would just show up at people's houses, collectors and dealers and stuff and be like, oh, I'm just going to stay here for a little bit. And, and uh, there's a few accounts of him painting over paintings of his that they own. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Waking up in the morning. And then there was a dealer that he, I guess, Asker Yorn was staying in his cottage and the guy went to town to get some wood and groceries and he came back and Asker Yorn had painted the whole thing. And so they exhumed that and brought it into the museum. Mm -hmm. That was fascinating. Um, I love all the Cobra, mm -hmm. stuff, all of them, even the ones that people don't know their names really, like Constant and Corneal. And, mm -hmm. but not, the household names are Asger Yorn and Appel. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I, I love all, everything they stood for and their approach, you know, very similar to Dubuffet where they were mm -hmm. into the children's eye and hand and how that could still be taken seriously or why it should be taken seriously. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I love, I love all that stuff. Yeah, I, I think part of the, the, the appeal, the love or the admiration for children's art is that when the child gets excited, as you know, uh, he or she, or they don't quite censor that excitement. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they trusted that full tilt anticipation, you know? Um, and so anyway, I can see that you're, that's one way to explain why you don't always edit so much of your work. You know, although you paint over things here and there to accentuate movement or expressionism or certain other related ethos, but never quite get too critical and edit things out, you know. Anyway, that I'm so happy that that reference is very, uh, very much in your mind. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Back to you, Kyle. Thank you, Fong. Um, so the next question I will read on the questioner's behalf um, is wondering if you're if you have any rapport with uh, with Gorky in your work. Of if course. You... I mean, any of these names that people think, of course, <laughs> Gorky, de Kooning, Gustin, Dubuffet. I mean, yeah, it, it, you know, um, 
but all the a lot of the women from the FX movement too that people don't really talk about as much like Grace Hardigan, Lee Krasner, um, Phyllis's buddy uh, Frankenthaler, all that stuff. Anything, anything and everything. Of course, I've seen it. You know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's no point in denying anything. It doesn't it doesn't make sense. So yeah, I love Gorky. Um, is a darker figure. I'm not super interested in his lifestyle <laughs> or the way it ended up for him. Um, but, you know, I think it's, uh, it's also unfair in a way that we get to just, these guys had these really intense, torturous lives and ways of working and brutal conditions. And then we get to just see their paintings all the time. And we get to look at them on iPhones and be like, oh, that's good. Or that's not good. Or digest it in, in such a pedestrian way. But um, that's the world we're living in. Well, thank, thank you for that. Um, next, Nick, would you like to ask a question? Um, sure. Well, I, I firstly, I want to thank you, Eddie and Jason. Uh, thank you, Eddie, at the beginning as we work through the tech and a big thanks to Pam for helping out there. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't bring up Rauschenberg as a yet another person of like, has this person influenced you or not? But um, I'm thinking more about collage and it was interesting how Fong talked about uh, editing. And I'm just curious sort of how you see or not see your work as a sort of collage of, of various things. Rauschenberg was my first, um... Well, my first artist crush was MC Escher. Um, I know that a lot of people don't even know who he is, but I was just fascinated by him. But then my first like real New York artist that I was aware of was Rauschenberg. Um, I think because I worked in a Barnes and Noble in high school and um, they had a huge book there and I just would thumb through it every day. I was fascinated by it. Um, I do think that I have a lot to do with collage actually. I mean, I, a lot of paintings, I, I'm not sure if there's anything in this show, but a lot of paintings, I cut up failed paintings and glue them onto other things. So that's a direct collage. But I do think that maybe I think and see compositions in a, under the filter of a collage, like placing things and cut and paste kind of um, problem solving. Yeah. That makes sense. No. It does no? Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you very much, Nick. We have one question from the audience from Nathaniel Moody. I will ask to unmute you. What? What was the question? I'm I'm uh, asking to unmute oh. him now. <laughs> So confused. Did I get asked the question? Oh, hi. Oh, no. He's coming live. Can you hear me? Hey, man. How are you? Good. How's it going? Good. I haven't seen you in. Hey, like so my question years. is um, <laughs> I know it's been a long time. Um, question is if I, I may be wrong, but I've seen some pictures of uh, a child recently on Instagram. So I'm assuming you're a dad. Is that right? Yeah. Awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. My question is, um, how has becoming a parent affected your practice, whether in subject matter or um, just studio practice in and of itself? And um, is it affecting kind of how you perceive things, how you think about making things um, in any way? Well, I lost some of that, but I think that mostly I understand what you're saying. Um, well, I think it's a super holistic thing. And so it affects every aspect of my life and my thinking and um, prioritizing for sure and so I think that in regards to the studio I think more in 
set amounts of time versus before I had a kid, it was, you know, work until exhaustion or I don't want to be there anymore. That could be five in the morning, but now I leave at pretty much the same time every day. Um, as far as uh, content or anything, I mean, I make a lot of drawings of his toys at home and there's some pacifiers and paintings. I think there's a big pacifier in that tabletop painting. Um, stuff like that. I mean, he's just happiness and lightness and not taking myself as seriously is, has just been a real relief. And he's brought all of that to me. And um, I just want to be more like him. So that's how he affects me. All right. Well, thank you for that, Eddie, and thank you for for the entire conversation. Thank you again, Jason. This was been this has been really really wonderful, and I'm sorry to all the questions we didn't get to today. Um, <clears throat> at the rail, it's awesome. Thank you so much, Cal. Of course. And I at think Eddie, I want to just con I just want to say one thing. I just want to concur with you, Eddie. I think you know one thing that has really helped us get through this pandemic is it, 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 those of us have kids is yeah. be able to spend more time with our kids. Um, it's important to say from the perspective of dads and also moms. But I know a lot of you out there feel the same way. So thanks again, Eddie, it was great. We're looking forward to uh, the poetry now, which is coming. Ali, go ahead, Cal. Great, so thank you, Jason. At The Rail, we have a tradition of ending um, all of our lunches with a poem, and we've carried that over here into these community events. And so today I'm thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Ali Black, to the stage. Allie Black is a writer from Cleveland, Ohio. She's the recipient of the Academy of American Poets University and College Poetry Prize for her poem, Kinsman. Her work has appeared in December, uh, Jubliat, Lit Hub, The Offing, and elsewhere. Her first book of poetry, If It Heals at All, was selected by, the, by Jackie Shelton Green for the New Voices series at Jakar Press. Without further ado, Allie, I've asked to unmute you. Hello, uh, thank you everyone for um, having me and Cal, thank you for that introduction. Can everybody hear me? Yes, okay, great. Thank you for inviting poetry into this space. Um, I feel like poetry is getting a lot of uh, good, good reputation right now and just getting a lot of good attention. So I appreciate you all welcoming me. Um, I'm going to read a poem uh, that Cal mentioned um, in the introduction, and it's titled Kinsman uh, for my fir first poem. Kinsman. The day after the baby is killed by a gunshot wound to the chest, you still have to ride behind death's blood red breath. You still have to picture the baby in the car trying to grab the bullet as if it were a glossy, sweet thing. You do not want to imagine the pitch of the baby's wail. You do not want to see the women walking with bright white save-a-lot bags wrapped around their wrists. You do not want to see the man at the RTA bus stop swatting at a bee. You do not want to see anyone trying to hurt anything. You do not want to face the red lights, the teddy bear memorials, the trash, the raggedy strollers, the slow, slow walk of the low down folks. You do not want to ride by the hand painted casino trip sign stapled high on a pole like a goal. You do not want to hear the radio scroll through tragedy and woe. You hear the beginning of the word Oregon, and you know the next stories will be about more shootings. You think about the baby killed by the bullet. Uh, this next poem is entitled Writing the 14. It's after a poet, uh, Russell Atkins, who is a, a native Clevelander. Writing the 14. And the 14 bus, just let me say, is also um, a reference to Kinsman Avenue, which is in Cleveland, Ohio. The, the number 14 bus rides up and down Kinsman Avenue. So this poem is called Riding the 14 after Russell Atkins. 
Little homie warns me about riding the 14, says his mama used to drive that route and she saw all kinds of things. And I tell him that's perfect because I'm trying to write a poem about riding the bus and I want to see all kinds of things, even things a woman shouldn't see. But when I board way before theft's hour, the bus is quiet and empty as a box. I take a seat in back behind a boy in a pink and purple fatigue do-rag. I stare at the nosy single braid poking out of his do-rag as if it wants to say hello. When we ride past 144th, I can't help but think about the four new bodies they found in a bando, and then two young girls board the bus. One girl is rocking a small afro and a pair of bamboo earrings with the word batty sliced through the center. She carries a copy of the autobiography of Asada Shakur, and now everything feels all right. And by the time I take my eyes off her and the book, at least a half dozen students have boarded and everybody seems to possess something purple, a pair of headphones, a hoodie, or a jacket. The students sit still, glued to their phones. And I think about my little homie's warning and realize I'm on at the wrong hour. I just have one more poem. And again, thank you all so much for having me. Um, this poem is entitled, How a Poem and a Wedding Saved My Life. So look, if that poem had never came as a hum in my ear, I'd still be in my corner apartment tallying all the times the world did me dirty. Poem came busting in like my mama sent it. Poem came with some kind of God in it. Poem said, it is so in you. I'ma shake the fear out you, but you better beat the devil till he turn black and blue. Poem had me calling Bina to see if she stopped by even though I had allowed the world to snatch a year away from us. Poem had me power walking with ankle weights on all up and down chagrin just in case the world tried to act like it wanted some more. Poem lifted me up in one stanza as if the stanza was an arm and the arm was covered in a sleeve and the sleeve was made up of all my brother's tattoos, meaning all his dead friends was there to help him lift and pull. Poem was in straight beast mode. And look, thank God black girls do in fact get married. If not, my girl Ronnie may have never needed the poet in me. And thank God she chose burnt orange and gold for her colors. Otherwise, I would have never known how it feels to be a walking sunset. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ali. Thank you for sharing your words. We really appreciate it. And thank you to Eddie and Jason again. And thank you to everyone who tuned in today and for, for all the questions. Um, and, and please join us Monday at 1 p.m. for conversations be between artists Mike Cloud and Samuel Javelin in conversation with Hobie Brock. And we'll conclude with a poetry reading from Zoe Brezhny. You can now turn your microphones on and say goodbye as you leave. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. you, Allie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. For coming. Appreciate it. <laughs> Amazing <you>, reading. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Jason. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, buddy. Allie, thank thanks you, for that Eddie. excellent thank poetry you. reading. Yes, thank you so much, thank Allie. You. Thank you, everybody. Great, great talk, everybody. <laughs>